All right, we're about to get ready to start testing again. I just got to finish out my Tesla coil and I'll be ready to get back to it. So, as many of you have seen already, I've wound my number two coil. Let me show it to you. That's not bad. I hand wound this thing. I created a little jig, was able to do it, worked out great. Now, just so you guys know, I did the jig in the cheapest way possible. You can add anything you want to it, motors, everything, that's on you. I wanted to take this experience of building a Tesla coil and make it accessible to everybody. So, doing it as simple as possible, everybody gets to see how it's done, not overly complicated. That way you can get into this thing and not feel intimidated that it's too much. So, anyway, with that being said, that's the number two coil. It worked out pretty good. This right here is a circuit. Right here. This is a ZVS circuit that I'm going to use. Now, why do I want this circuit? Some people think I get power crazy and just want to overpower everything. And not necessarily yet. You have to understand how this circuit works. You turn on a primary power source to the circuit anywhere from 12 to 40 volts, and you just want this thing to start to oscillate. What you're doing is you're taking the MOSFET and you're hitting the trigger for the MOSFET, and you're going to go ahead and turn on the process of making it oscillate. Now, that's a key feature in this because you can add a secondary power source to this that's a much higher amount of power. So, what they normally do in this system is they start it with 12 volts, get everything running. They're going to trip the trigger on the MOSFET, get it all started, right? Then they're going to go ahead and turn on the higher power. Now, they put a diode in there to protect the lower power source so it doesn't blow it while turning up the higher power. Pretty simple. You go, okay, you have one power, you have a second power, why do you want that? It's pretty simple. When we're dealing with the gravity flyer, we're looking for a feedback signal. When you get that feedback signal, what does it mean? It means that it's actually pushing power back into your Tesla coil to build up on the primary coil in order to get a burst of energy out of it, right? Well, two power sources will give me the same thing. If I have one power source on at low power, I can run my gravity flyer, start the field up, get it going, then I can come in when I'm ready and hit the button and it'll create a power surge to go through the Tesla coil, immediately bringing up the power. Now, does it have to be crazy? No, it doesn't. It could be a difference of like 10 volts. You could be at 40, you want to go to 50, that's it, boom, hit the button, you're there. Now. This means that you're going to have to tie in your ultrasound circuit because of this. Your gravity flyer itself makes the megahertz frequency. With everything going into it, that's what it does. So, when you run your piezo, you're putting in the frequency in the kilohertz range. And it's, it's going off, right? Going, going, going. You push the button. It stops forcing a signal in. It then picks up the frequency of the gravity flyer itself and now runs that and pushes it back out of the piezo itself. Because again, even though it's receiving, it's still transmitting. So that's what's going on here. So now you just have to think about it like this. Okay, now we usually wait for the signal from the Tesla coil to get the hum. We know what it is. Now we also need to trip the ultrasound at the same time. So as you turn off the ultrasound, you have to hit the power button for the Tesla coil. It's not that hard. It, you know, you don't have to do everything in circuitry. It's just a simple physical thing. You can basically create a little board that goes across the two buttons if they're the same height and push the center. That's pretty simple. That's a pretty much a done deal right there. It doesn't have to be overly complicated. Now, it also gives you the ability to let something build a little bit in it like when the ultrasound button's pushed, and then hit it. And you can play with the timing there, and it'll give you a better understanding of how this works. So, we can now bypass some of this. Now, is it important to still hear the sound and get it to trip exactly the way Alexi did it? Yes, because his system is all-encompassing. He's already taken every variable into account and put it all into one thing. 
what we're doing here is we're deconstructing it just a little bit and we're just looking at one part of it. We're not deconstructing the whole thing. You guys got to understand that this thing's so intertwined the way that he did it. It's so complex that you really have to do everything together. But if we really look at this one part, we can do this separate and just kind of pull it apart a little bit and get the understanding in it. So that's it. That's why I want to use the ZVS circuit. Not necessarily about the massive power. Now, the taller Tesla coil, Alexi did it in his last video. We're going to try it out. Now, I am making another number two coil. It's a little bit shorter. May make a difference, may not. We'll see. But I want to keep something in the process, of, you know what I mean, of getting it to oscillate properly at the maximum amount of power you can get out of it. Then tune it down and the amount of power you put into it and get it going. I've been talking to Sean online about this. He's building the ZVS thing as well. And just going back and forth, back and forth. It really, really helps at understanding this. So, you know, if you think your comments are not being heard, please understand this. I do hear them. And I, I do understand something. And we're all watching the same video, but we all see it differently on how the circuit works. So by going back and forth, it really helps that. Anyway, second part of this, okay? We're going to change up our high voltage circuit just a little bit. Now, I normally run two ZVSs. Excuse me, one ZVS, two flybacks. Now, I'm going to change that. And it's a difference in understanding. Normally, I'm looking to create a field up here, center disc, field down here. That's the way Alexi says to do it. However, in talking to TT, we may have something totally different going on. So I'm going to explore that a little bit in this, and it makes perfect sense of why he says it. Now, you see my gravity flyer right back here, right? Let's try to make this simple. We're talking a field up here on this top plate, and that field will go around right here, right? In the normal configuration from Alexi. The field also comes in down here. Now, what TT's saying is, these two discs are connected. Therefore, the field goes over the outside and meets here. Now, why would that make perfect sense to me? Well, let's just understand this. When we look at this, if these magnets are locked to this top plate, and they are by the eddy current that it creates, and then we have the field when it starts, go straight from this, straight down through the center plate. That's where the field starts. So you go, okay, if the field starts there and then we're bringing out the power, right? So field's here, you bring out the power, it comes to here. You bring out the power, it comes to here. Now we have an understanding of why Alexi turns it up the way he does. It makes perfect sense. We get to the outer edge with the actual uh, field. So it makes one field that wraps around like this. Makes perfect sense. Why? If you turn on the field here with the Tesla coil, now what you're doing is you're taking this field out here and you're pumping it out real quick. Just like that. Boom. That's when it hits. You build it, build it, build it with a Tesla coil that comes out here. Boom. You hit it. Okay, just like that. Field in between here. All right. Let's try to make that as best shot as I can. And... Comes out, comes out, comes out, because the Tesla coil pushes the actual high voltage. And yes, it does do that in field testing. I've done it. So, boom, we hit it with the more power. Now, what's going on here? It's a magnetic volt, not necessarily a, uh, normally we, I, I always say that it's a, uh, it's more of a static volt. So, just understand this. It's just a difference in thinking. With a static volt, it's free to go out in big distances. And it's free to create a bigger field. But in a magnetic volt, you're looking to create a magnetic field just around the disk. Therefore, it stays right there. It stays right there on that disk, right? And it's harder to come off. But because the top and the bottom are connected, because those magnets are locked into this... Creating a magnetic volt makes sense, or a magnetic field makes sense. Now, we have it interlocked. What will happen? This is one thing that shows up in testing 
that we don't necessarily understand, but I think I understand it based on this theory. When this locks into this, this will stay the same speed. This upper disc is the one that changes. And if you've ever seen my testing, you understand I take the upper disc and I slow it down in order to hit the resonance frequency in the center plate. Now it starts to make sense. If that's the process going on, the magnetic field is now built around the top and built around the bottom. I can now slow down this upper disc because of that magnetic field. It's not just the eddy current. The eddy current ties it together. The actual high voltage field that turns into like a magnetic field is actually going to give me the ability to turn it and change it. So, what does that mean for us? Say, okay, that's a great theory. It works like this. What does it mean as far as the circuits? Well, all it simply means is we're going to take these circuits here and we're going to switch them. We're going to get rid of the two flybacks. We're going to go to a single flyback. That's what I said last time, but I think I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to take my AC flyback and then I'm going to hook just a couple levels of a voltage multiplier. Not the entire thing like I did when I blasted this thing out with a ton of voltage. I just want to get a little bit and I want to make sure they lock. So the test is, once we have the disc going, we have the high voltage on. I need to see the speed change in the upper disc. Now I've seen it with the two flybacks. Okay, we've gotten this thing to move down and drop about uh, 0.5 volts, but I want to see it a little more. I want it to be like uh, just easier lock is what I'm looking for. So when I change that out, I'm looking for an easier lock between those two plates. If I can get that and get that upper disc to slow down faster, I know I've created the field. Now, because it has to be in some type of voltage where it can expand. This is the problem with using other circuits. The flyback does it. The actual AC flyback does it if you know what you're doing. It has to expand out. Again, it's in here between the magnets and the two plates on the upper and the bottom. We now need it to expand like this. In order to do that, you must have voltage that'll actually allow it to do it. If you create something that's purely magnetic, it'll stay right here. It won't go anywhere. It'll stay right here. So what do you have to do? You have to thin out this thing where you have the amps and the voltage absolutely correct and done. You want a few more amps. Okay, we're in the milliamps. We want to bring it up to like one or two amps. We do not want to go over that. We want the voltage to stay high so that we can get the expansion of the field. That's important here. So, just a different understanding. We'll change one thing at a time. We'll go to one flyback first, and we'll change our test coil. We'll see where we get with that, see what the testing shows. Then, we'll switch to the AC flyback and do that. Again, we have to do it in stages because you have to be able to separate what's going on with each one. And you don't want some kind of test where you change everything at once and you get this tremendous change and you don't know exactly what's going on. Then you have to take it back down, take it apart, and get back to the simple thing and redo the test that you should have done the first time, which is one thing at a time, see what it does, see what we can get going. These are the two extra ideas we're going to throw in, guys. At some point, this thing's got to give us something. I'm just, I'm not looking for a lot. It could tip over. It can give me a little bump off the ground. Whatever. Just give me a sign of life. I'm sure you guys all want the same. Now, just so you know, when I do testing, we have the Gravity Flyer group on the Facebook. When I do testing now, I go on there and I update people on the testing and stuff like that. I guess it's one of those membership things I could do if I wanted people to pay a lot of money, which I don't really care. Look, I want everybody to have the information. So, you go on there for free. You can see me updating this thing on the testing days. Usually I'll make a video in the beginning of the day or something until they let you know I'm testing or hey, I'm testing tomorrow or something like that. And you'll be able to check it out. But I do an update, you know, as I get in between each test that I do, I'll leave a message on there and let you know where I'm at. We can all conversate a little bit and then I get back to my testing and keep going. And 
I generally like to do that. It's pretty good. Keep everybody informed. Keep everything going. And that's on the Gravity Flyer group on the Facebook. So if, if you haven't checked it out, I'll leave a link in the description. You guys can check it out. It's pretty cool. Everybody on there has some awesome builds that they're doing, by the way. Congratulations to everybody on there. We have some tremendous builds. Everybody's going through it and working through the process and seeing why things are the way they are. And then, you know, it's got to be the most exciting thing in the world when you actually get your project up and going. You know what I mean? You start to see the motors spin. You start to see, hear the ultrasound popping off and you're going, oh my God, this old man online, he was right. You know what I mean? We are getting these things. And it's really, really awesome, man. I, I'm proud of everybody on there. You guys are doing awesome. And guys, some of the people on there are way more advanced on Tesla coil building than I am. Some people, their knowledge of physics is just out of this world, man. Something that I can't do. Okay, some people are into the math and they calculate everything. And they calculate fields and everything. Guys, something beyond a little bit more than what I do. I just try to stick to the physical things. I use an oscilloscope. I use voltage meters. I use all kinds of different stuff. I just show you what I do physically. That's really it. The rest of the stuff, it all goes in my logbook. And I just write everything down for my charts to see exactly if I'm making progress, not making progress. And then I generally tell you guys if I am. So kind of the bookkeeping stuff is what I call it. And I keep that stuff to myself. But uh, as far as the rest of the stuff, I show you guys the actual experiments so you guys can let your mind wander a little bit and see what you think of it and come up with extra ideas because sometimes, guys, the greatest breakthroughs are not made by me. They're made by you, and I incorporate them in my uh, project and get it going. But anyway, with that being said, we're on the right page. We're, we're getting there. I mean, look, we, we've been focusing on this channel for about four months now. It's important to know that. In four months, what we've discovered, frequencies, sound, harmonics, we went through everything in here, voltages, understanding it, building Tesla coils, changing Tesla coils, you know, everything you could do, high voltage fields. So if you've been watching my channel, thank you for that. And to be honest with you, hopefully you guys see the progress in what we're doing. You know, once this thing lifts, man, I, I, I don't know, it's going to be kind of the, the end of the building project. It's going to be a process where then we're just trying to, you know, tear it down and amplify certain parts. So that we can change it into solid state. So we can make it go faster. But part of the process is building this thing and getting it to do something. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. Any Anything, any signs of life? Yeah, I'm there. So, yeah, crazy old man. Let's keep going. Anyway, guys, one last thing. I'm going to try to go live tomorrow. And then you guys can start asking me some questions. Uh, should be a fun show. Uh, last time it, it went off without a hitch. We did really well. So... Anyway, we'll just do that. And, you know, like I said, Facebook group, you want to hear some live updates of what's going on, get on there and uh, check us out. I'll leave the link in the description. And then let's go ahead and change all this stuff. I should be testing on Tuesday, as long as everything goes right with the testicle circuit and I can get it up and running. This will be the second time that I'm doing it. A lot more advanced knowledge. Uh, Archangel, thank you for the video on how to tune these things. It really helps. Uh, so I'm going to go back and do that and get this thing all done. And we're going to be set to go. We're going to have something that hopefully works on Tuesday. We'll start testing then. Monday, I'm going to try to do the live. And I'll set that up as soon as I'm done here and post it. Uh, uh, so everybody knows probably 4 o'clock uh, California time. So what, 7, 8 o'clock uh, East Coast. Anyway, probably 7. Anyway, that's it, guys. So, uh, if you like what you saw here today, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. Do all those fun things. Have yourself a great day. Thank you.